Um, ladies and gentlemen, next we have Chris Gabriel, the Chief Technology uh, Officer from today's main sponsor, Logicalis. A round of applause for Chris Gabriel, please. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I get echo Simon's uh, comments really around the uniqueness of this event, both in the UK um, and also uh, in, in other parts of the world where the combination of, of educators of the IT industry and of government get together to understand really, as, as, as Simon said, kind of the tectonic plate shifts that we're seeing uh, both in terms of the technology world and how that is driving uh, the world we live in. Um, I'm not going to talk to you today at all about what Logicalis do, which will be a relief. Um, uh, to all of you. Um, what I'd like to try and do is give you our view, really sourced from a couple of places, is, uh, is where we think the world is, is now in terms of technology and opportunity, the kind of skills that we're seeing um, uh, really developing in the IT space, and some of those skills which I think are not obvious. Um, I think we spend a lot of time talking about apps and web development and social media, and there's lots of jobs in social media is the impact and the spread of technology is now so great and will be so great that I think there are opportunities for countries like Wales to really take a foothold and a lead um, in, in, the le in the less obvious spaces in what the IT industry uh, has to offer. Um, one of the things about being a speaker, um, oh sorry, you can follow me on Twitter as, as, as well, I'm, I'm, uh, and I'm 45, but I, uh, I'm social media uh, literate, please say nice things, um, is, it's always good to give you just a history of why I think I have got a level of uh, expertise to stand on this stage and talk to you. Um, I grew up in the first heyday of uh, technology that was available to the masses, which was the home computing kind of revolution which was started by Jobs and Wozniak in 76 with Apple, um, but then actually spread really quickly around uh, the world and certainly to the UK. Um, this is my favorite tech firm of all time, uh, based in Wales, it's Dragon Data, who really tried to attack and transform the home computing marketplace uh, with their Dragon uh, range of computers built in Wales. Um, uh, all the, the young people have left now. I was going to say that this had 64K of memory. Uh, I was trying to think of a way of explaining how small that was to a 17, 18 year old now, but I don't think there's, th there's, a, there's an equation as big as an elephant or as small as whatever for the amount of memory that these things had. Um, I then started in, in computer clubs. Uh, I'm from Wrexham in North Wales, by the way. Um, and we had a great computer club uh, held at the Memorial Hall Thursday night, and the only skill was being able to carry a 29-inch black and white television uh, from your house into the centre of town, uh, and all the paraphernalia that went with it. It wasn't turning up with an iPad and, and kicking off. There was a huge amount of investment there. Um, I believe I invented the in-store uh, advertising marketplace. My dad was a fishmonger in North Wales. Um, and I managed to convince all of the stallholders in the street to pay me money to write a computer advertising program that would sit in the hairdresser shop, and I made uh, about £20 a week out of that, uh, and that was back in 1983. Um, and then, the reason I'm saying all of this, is I, was the, I am the product of a government intervention. Uh, in 1982-3, Wrexham Council set up something called an ITEC, which is an information technology centre, which was there to take children from school that weren't going to go to university, because in, in, in those days it was, a, it, was a, it was a hope rather than a given in a lot of cases, um, and teach them about technology. But it wasn't just about you know, what was the, the obvious stuff. It was from circuit board design to typing to programming. Uh, I was one of Wales' worst COBOL programmers for a time uh, back in the 80s. But it was a grounded education across the whole aspects of IT. And the Wrexham iTech is still going. Uh, the interesting thing for me is I went there in 1984. Uh, that was 30 years ago. Um, I'm not sure what's happened between 1984 and now in terms of how government has used interventions to help uh, children move into that, that industry. Um, and then finally that cul culminated in my first ever st stage presentation, uh, which was when uh, Margaret Thatcher visited the iTech uh, uh, to, much, uh, uh, to much interest of the, uh, of the local people. Um, and uh, that was me back in 1984 with a lot more hair um, and some of the largest spectacles you've ever seen. But um, my, my career uh, and where I am now is directly linked hopefully to some innovation on my part, but to a government intervention in the IT space for skills, for education, uh, and for taking people 
um, with some raw talent and turning them into something that, that was marketable, that could go out there and, 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 and earn a living. Um, Logicalis is now a $1.6 billion business. I, I, didn't start, I didn't found it, I've worked there for nine years. Um, and we work around the world in about 25 countries, helping organizations, um, government, education, exploit and use technology uh, for uh, the benefit of, of citizens or, or, or students or, uh, or consumers. So one of the things that we've done at Logicalis in the UK uh, since 2007 uh, is interview about 1,000 13 to 17 year olds. Um, as a company that tries to go and convince businesses and governments to spend money on technology, we really wanted to understand what was driving uh, some of their attitudes. Um, and this goes back to 2007, which in technology terms is, is a lifetime. Um, but we really wanted to, to really get an understanding of did we have a, a, a society of digital natives? When would they become digital natives at home with technology? What were some of their aspirations and what were some of the challenges that, that they saw? Um, so the first survey was in 2007, and just to, to prove uh, the risks of doing any surveys and predictions, is back in 2007, the average 13 to 17 year old in the UK would not get out of bed and use social media unless it was called Bebo. Um, I don't think, if we got all those, those guys back in the room, any of them would even have heard of Bebo at that point. But they had 45% approval rating of 13 to 17 year olds in the UK for use of social media. The next one was MySpace. And our friends at Facebook at the time had a whopping 9% support amongst the 13 to 17 year olds of the UK as a social media platform. If I take that forward to now, Bebo, still, still, still around, um, has operating income of 1.1 million US dollars. And our friends at Facebook have operating income of about uh, 3.8 billion dollars in terms of uh, operating income profit. So a dramatic change uh, in terms of what's gone on in just those intermediate years, in terms of what the expectation of, of, of that generation uh, are. We do a lot of work with uh, higher education, and we talk to CIOs in the higher education uh, uh, marketplace a lot around the world, and it is the toughest job in the world. How many companies sack all their employees every year and hire brand new ones who are younger than the ones they just had, who expect more than the ones they just had, and start over again virtually every single year, trying to meet the expectations of, of that new uh, cohort? It's a supremely challenging space. And you see from here is the dynamics of, of what uh, the, the generations feel is good enough, is the one they want to use, is constantly changing. If I fast forward to 2014, this was a survey that we just carried out. Um, it's going back to my days working on a 64K computer. The average 13 to 17 year old in the UK carries around with them about 192 gigabits of storage. Okay. So they carry more in their pocket than probably Wrexham Computer Club ever had passed through its doors in, 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 in the lifetime of it. Okay. We are seeing, obviously, as we've discussed here, the growth in coding. Um, I'm not convinced coding is the holy grail of being in the IT industry, and I'll talk about that in a while, but we are seeing a growth in coding, and Raspberry are following me. I think Raspberry is the new, biggest, uh, exciting thing that's ever happened uh, in terms of I can carry into Rexham Computer Club a, a computer that big that has more power than we all had collectively. Okay? And we've, we, we clearly understand that everybody has a device, everybody has more than one device. Um, according to our survey, the average 13 to 17 year old now owns six devices. As I'll talk about another thing, I'm not sure that means they are digital explorers and will drive the economy through a new digital revolution, is they are digital users, and owning a device doesn't mean uh, guiding uh, and, and opening up opportunities in terms of employment. We clearly, uh, in terms of media, is back in 2007, only 39% had posted their own video online. Now we're up to 61% and above different for, for different age, uh, age groups as you go through those years and different in terms of boys and girls, um, in terms of the sexes. And things like social media um, has obviously grown and we're all uh, using social media. But again, the rate of change, and we see this in terms of the, the growth in the digital universe, in the ability of people to create and post and share their own content is driving a huge growth in back office IT systems is, again, it's using how do we use that propensity uh, in digital to really create new opportunities, skills, uh, and, and educational opportunities. But what was absolutely clear through all of our surveys from 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14, is this generation does not think employers, higher education, 
and government are ready for them. Now, it's a perception they have. It's not always a reality. But the most fascinating uh, result that we've had over the last few years has been, in this case, 85% of that generation would love to engage with on government online services. Uh, again, I, I, could be, I could be wrong, but the, the majority of government services I engage with are paying my tax bill, uh, renew my MOT, or getting a fine if I haven't renewed it on time. Okay? is what are the services that this generation would use and how would they engage. But the overwhelming propensity of the, this generation is to engage digitally. The point is, can we capture that uh, willingness and how do we use that for, for, for good of all? So I think the thing that I want to talk about over the next thing is that I don't think the evolution of IT is the fact that we sit at smarter computers or use different applications. I think there's a whole world out there that isn't based on what we think of as traditional IT. I think traditional IT skills are hugely important. I think digital literacy across all uh, uh, people is, is, is vitally important now. And going back to one of Simon's point about these emerging economies, and I'm lucky enough to visit a, a good chunk of the, uh, the, the countries that are emerging. I'm in Brazil uh, a reasonable amount of time. Is in terms of technology and skills and investment, they are an emerged economy. We shouldn't kid ourselves into thinking that they are somehow, you know, they have lots of poverty there, but the governments of South America are hugely interested in technology interventions, in investment, in fundamental core infrastructure and services for their people. We just done a project in Uruguay where we've connected 800 primary schools across Uruguay with video so they can have remote English lessons from the British Council. Every primary school child in Uruguay gets given a laptop when they join school. Every single primary school child in Uruguay gets given a laptop and has access to these digital services. Now, they don't understand it's technology. They just understand it's the most, their favorite lesson of the week, which is English, done from someone through the video screen. But this emergence of these new applications and these new ways of, of applying technology to problems, and as Simon said, not trying to find markets to solve a problem, but actually trying to uh, develop new things, is happening all over the world. But I'm not sure it's about creating a new generation of kind of techno hoodies who, who you know, we focus, I, I think it's interesting, we talk about innovation, exploitation of digital, and all the conferences I go to, we come back to app development, websites, social media, okay? So we've kind of gone from, hey, it's, it's new and it's exciting, and we keep coming back to the same answers, which is kind of the stuff that's very apparent. I think there's a whole wider world out there that we, we need to tap into. Um, interestingly about digital uh, literacy, digital natives versus digital explorers, these are my two uh, girls, picture taken not too long ago. Um, we're not very good at nicknames in our house, so we call Charlotte 4Gig Classic Girl because she was born uh, in 2003. Um, Emily is now seven, just turned seven a month ago. Uh, the evolution of technology for her from Charlotte was four gig to eight gig and the device got smaller and funkier and better designed. Okay? And Emily has just turned seven, so she's kind of six, you know, seven and a little bit. Is the fascinating thing for me in terms of evolution is the iPad was born in 2010. Going back to the iPod, as Simon spoke about, is the iPad is only half as old as my youngest daughter who feels like she's a baby still. Okay, this thing has only been on the market for four and a bit years and it's transformed massively both in terms of how we use technology, the development of applications around that and the applications that this technology can now be taken to which isn't traditional IT uh, uh, kind of skills that we think. So I think the opportunity for Wales, I think the opportunity for the UK, I think the opportunity that is already being grabbed around the world is that yes we have lots of digital natives. But you're going to be, if you, if you are born, if you're a seven-year-old girl living in Newbury today, you are a digital native whether you like it or not. My daughter is a digital native. It doesn't mean she's going to change the world f through technology. It means she can use it. And she's very literate on it. And she can do all the wonderful things on an iPad um, that I don't think she should be able to do. And we try and constantly stop them doing it. But I think we need to look a bit wider. So if you look at children when they are born and want to grow up, OK? They think about being lots of things. They certainly think about being doctors and medical uh, professionals. They think about being engineers. Think about being, everybody wants to be a pilot, uh, apart from wearing glasses and not being very fit, it grew me out of, of, of that job. Uh, educators, teachers, want to be police officers, 
law enforcement. If you look at what's happening now in New York, where law enforcement has become highly digitized in terms of how the New York Police Department use technology to, to stop crime, solve crime, respond to, to crime. Sports people, we had a huge in, influx of sports uh, uh, degrees uh, a, a while back. We're now seeing that flip back to sciences. Uh, retailers, whether it's shoppers or, or the owner of a retail, some of us madly want to work in an office all day uh, and not do those exciting things. Um, producers and musicians, um, I'm sure all of you know that uh, Apple just bought its biggest acquisition ever, which was a company that made headphones and digital streaming uh, and now made a hip hop producer a billion dollars from that acquisition. So again, uh, in terms of music, and we're all kind of drivers and we're all commuters. What that actually means is there's an opportunity for everybody to be technologists. Because I think the future is not going to be driven by pure technologists. I think it's going to be driven by line of business technologists. I think it's going to be driven by doctors who become technologists or engineers who apply technologists. Cisco have either spoken or will speak about the internet of things and the internet of everything. It's everything will have a sensor, everything will have a technology bias to it. It might be a really small piece of that, technology, that device or the application but it will be there. I was over in Geneva a couple of weeks ago with the world's largest producer of hydraulic valves and pipes. Uh, super, super, I know it sounds boring, but it was a super interesting visit, okay? Because they build pipes that go into jet liners, into ships, into mines. They do it into baby's drips. They do it into all sorts of applications. Everything has got a hydraulic pump on it. They don't have a sensor on virtually any of those pumps today. In the future, every single one of the devices they make will have a technology element to it that will provide information or data or something an application developer can do something with or a scientist or a doctor can do something with to, to, to add value. So I think we need to look at what children want to be and then understand that there will be a technology element to every single part of that in the future. Okay? And it doesn't really mean you have to grow up and go to university and study technology to be sex successful in technology. You can study medicine or engineering or music or art or retail science and then become a technologist afterwards. I think there's a huge opportunity that we need to, we need to understand. Because the one thing I think children never grow up thinking is, I want to work in IT. Okay? Very few children have woken up and thought, well, actually, I'm going to work in IT when I get older. Okay? But they do want to work in all those other professionals where the technology slant to that, the technology uh, capability of turning that into a new kind of industry, a disruptive industry, is absolutely huge. And this is going on around the world, certainly where, where, where we are in business. We see a huge amount of this already. And it is the emerging nations that are doing more of it than the emerged ones. It's the Brazils, it's the Indonesias, it's the Malaysias that are really, it's the Uruguays, the Paraguays, the Mexicos, who are really investing and understanding the opportunity here to drive their traditional industries and, and economic position through a technology bias. So what we need is people who are going to build these new experiences, and we're going to need people who are going to run the technology that allows those experiences to, to, to operate. So the old skills are kind of not going away. Okay, in IT, there's, there's a huge amount of opportunity there, but there's a greater blue sky opportunity in how we build these new experiences. If you think about mobile, mobile was you know, a phone getting a signal and sending a text message. The average smart device now does lots of things. It now runs a whole bunch of enterprise applications. We can kind of be a business person through our, our mobile device now. And now it can be a bedside device. It can be an engineering device. Okay? It can be an in-store customer device. It can do lots and lots of different things with the development of applications and the interconnectedness of those devices. So the, the opportunities in this space are endless and growing every day. And we're going to see the technology, as I've said, really touch every industry, every sector. But I think it will be those sector people that drive it as much as the technology people. I think it will be an engineer who spots a really good idea. I actually think it will be a child at school learning that will spot a really good idea that a technology intervention could help them do what they are trying to do at the time, whether that's learn or treat a patient or find uh, oil un un under, under the ground. And the applications, given that device is four years old today, is the wealth and diversity of applications the applications of those applications into the world is growing every single day. And this isn't a market that's in Wales, it's not just a UK thing or a European thing. This can happen anywhere and everywhere. And you also see the investments going into those new places as well. 
And if you think just about the experience of, of how this will, this, will, this will play out, is if I just think of a petrol station. I was with the CIO of, of a, a large uh, oil company uh, a few months ago, and we were just talking about what a petrol station is. And if you look at it from a, its IT perspective, you kind of don't see much. If you think about it, firstly, in terms of these experiences that you could have, okay, finding the petrol station in the first place through your, 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 your map app, but being driven there by an, an offer, so don't just fill up, fill up and get a voucher all through your mobile application. That's a retail experience that someone who's done a degree and who spent time understanding retail will understand. And then actually, I'm the worst when, when we're going on holiday. I never want the kids to get out of the car and cross a busy forecourt. So I want them to shop before they get there. I want them to choose their magazines or their chocolates or their sweets or their drinks. And then I want that to click and collect when I get to the petrol station. Okay? I also want to have access to other services, and maybe I don't want to pay for those, so I want some sponsored Wi-Fi when I pull in. And maybe I want a free download off iTunes because I've chosen that petrol station. And actually, I don't want to get money out at all. I just want to pay through my e-wallet, or actually I want my car to pay at some point in the future. I think we all get these. These are kind of these web development, these app developments. If I think about what's under that petrol station, it's really interesting. So we use AMPR today in petrol stations to kind of police petrol stations is 150,000 people in the UK every year put the wrong fuel into their car. There is no reason why that should happen anymore because the AMPR knows your car registration and knows what fuel type it takes, so why can't an intelligent petrol pump decide not to give you petrol if you run a diesel car? Okay. Why can't that be paid for by the insurance firm? You've got one of the largest insurance firms in, in the UK, in Wales. Is the, the petrol station may not pay, but the insurance firm who's having to pay £5,000 to have the car fixed may well decide that's a good innovation and use of, of their money. We're seeing the petrol pumps, uh, the, the tanks under the ground now being monitored in real time. Why? Because the logistics company delivering the fuel want to get the right truck to the right place to make sure supply is right, to make sure the price is right. So we've got these operational technologies that sit under. Someone in IT, best will in the world, someone in IT is probably not going to think about very few of those. It's going to be those disciplines uh, of other technologies. And then we've got our traditional IT technologies in the middle. So this blend of experience technologies, of information technologies, of operational technologies. And I think we're going to see a whole bunch of new XT people, not IT people, but XT people emerge. And I think we need to foster and make sure that they understand the opportunity of technology. And it doesn't mean doing a three-year technology degree. It means understanding your line of business expertise, your professional expertise, and then understand enough about technology. So I think the world of X technologies is endless. I think it's going to grow. I think we're seeing it now. And the reason it's going to grow is, I always come back to whiteboards. We love whiteboards in IT. Is in traditional IT, we've only got so many of them. In business technology and experiences, there are more. And in the everything technologies, there'll be hundreds of thousands of those opportunities to sit and innovate and develop product, develop careers, develop technologies that change the way we, we live, work, play, uh, and do business. And I think this generation is coming. So this is my final uh, kind of view, is that we're seeing the developers come through, we're seeing the programmers come through, we're seeing Raspberry doing a huge job in terms of educating and pushing that, that coding, but I think we need to see that focus back on those XT people to make sure that we don't lose the opportunity to drive those brand new experiences of, of, of either business or, or operational technologies that could really provide an incubator for economic uh, generation in the technology space. And finally, we shouldn't forget the fact that it's not all about technology. So Jonathan Ive is the guy that really created the iPad in terms of design. The reason we love using it isn't because of the technology, it's because somebody designed the technology that we really wanted to use. So if I go back to where I started, which was a government intervention in the technology marketplace, I think the opportunities are huge. I think we need to invest. I think Wales has the levers to pull. I think together in terms of the industry and educators and government, there are some huge opportunities out there. We need to identify not the opportunities, but how we address them. And I think there's a really interesting next few years uh, available uh, in Wales uh, that really could see it drive itself into this new world of, of XTs. And I'd like to now hand back. Thank you. Thank you.